Morning, welcome to worship. We have a lovely day planned and I hope you stay and just chat with each other out in the parking lot today since we're not able to have fellowship time due to COVID. Um, we're also canceling the potluck next week. Unfortunately, um, I'll just take Pastor Phil out to lunch with my family, hopefully, before he heads back to Kansas. Um, due to COVID, we're going to try to only have things outside and just not right to do at this time. And it's supposed to be hot next Sunday. So, But we do have flyers for the ice cream social. They're back there by the newsletter. So please take one and give it to somebody that you think might join us for the ice cream social August 29th, 6 to 8, out in the parking lot. There's other announcements in your bulletin and in the newsletter. This week, we will be having a deacons meeting at 2 p.m. in the annex. It's not in there, so there's that in the leadership team meeting next week. Um, we are still planning to have the barbecue in September and then game night in October, but we will have to keep track of how things are with COVID. Please feel free to wear a mask. If you feel more comfortable doing so, make sure you socially distance. We don't want anyone becoming ill. Are there other announcements for the good of the church? Jay? Yeah, please speak into the mic because they won't hear you on the Facebook thing. The, uh, the Church of the Brethren uh, Western Plains District Conference was held uh, July 23 and 24. And I'd like to celebrate uh, that the leadership team slate, the outdoor ministry team member, uh, Steve Ward from our congregation, was uh, chosen by the district to serve this year. And uh, we appreciate that very much. And as you know, Steve and Daylene have been involved with Camp Herman for many years uh, throughout uh, recent memory. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We also have someone on the ethics committee for the district, and we appreciate her work, Martha. Yes. Well, I have a joy to share. Our um, great-granddaughter was born on August 4th on my birthday. Isn't that cool? And uh, her name is Nora LaVey, and mom and baby are doing fine. Thank you. What a joy. Let's oh, go ahead. I just want to, I don't know if we're asking for prayers right now. or That's not. fine. <laughs> um, Bud's dad fell again. And uh, we, we are going down this weekend, uh, this coming weekend. Um, they have a Whiteman reunion every uh, second Saturday in August. And so we're just hopeful that when we get there, he'll be, he'll be doing better. So just prayers for Phil. Thank you. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Please stand for the call to worship. God shows no partiality. No race or group is shown special advantage. In every nation, anyone who respects him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message God sent to all through the people of Israel. It is a message of peace by Jesus Christ, who has been made Lord of all. Amen. And now we will sing with happy voices, sing number 83 in the hymnal. be seated. Does any have one have any additional prayers or concerns to add to what we already heard? This week we are going to pray for three churches I've missed in the district. The Buckeye Church with the youth coordinators of the district, the community church in Hutchinson, which is Anita Christian and Matt Christian, Judd Hordenbaker and Mario Oltman, quite a team of pastors there, and today Eden Valley Church, which the D district leadership team chair is the pastor there. So please remember those in your prayers. We have um, Nisa Strings here in our church today having recitals. That's why Oscar is center stage. And um, they were here yesterday doing rehearsals very safely, most of them wearing masks. We were very impressed with the way, and they had it set up so not everyone was here. They're having four recitals today. She's doing a good job of making sure everybody's safe, so I was very glad to see that. And I'm getting to say hello, and they took some of the tomatoes Sharon brought. Please remember to take tomatoes and zucchini and squash that is out there be, as you leave. Don't forget, there are many things on our hearts this morning, so let us bow our hearts in prayer. Lord, we thank you for new life, for Nora Levine, this beautiful baby given to Jim and Karen as their great-granddaughter. Bless their parents, bless all those to raise her. 
In your name, we ask for prayers for Phil Whiteman as he fell, Lord, be with him and his caretakers. We ask that Larry is taking care of Judy's brother as well, and he's able to come here to Lincoln, that you lift up Joel von Spreckelsen in rehab now. There's other prayers in our hearts, Lord. Please hear our prayers. Jesus, humble us. Enter our self-righteous hearts and allow us to imagine how your love abounds past all barriers. Help us to love more like you, see more like you, and be more like you in our thinking, in our words, and in our actions. From the words of St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us show so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Be with those suffering mentioned here today and those we have silently in our hearts. Be with those suffering from COVID and grant us a way out of this, we pray, Lord. Be the, with our leaders, guide us in your paths you have set before us, we pray. Grant us serenity and allow us to feel your never-ending, all-consuming love today and throughout the week. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Can someone, oh, you're going to use that mic? Do yeah, you I need a handheld? Use, yeah. Okay. 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 Why don't you two come up here? <laughs> yeah, if you could sit on the band. Hey, when I give you a signal. <laughs> Good morning. I think, how about if you sit on the bench and then you can see what Peyton and Libby have There's a surprise. A surprise. Yeah. yeah, sit over there so you can see the surprise, okay? <laughs> or, you know what? This is good too. They can come down there and show it to everybody. All right. Oh, we're good. Well, I'm going to, whoops. <laughs> I know, she's going to get tangled up in the cord, isn't she? Well, I'm going to tell you a story today about a man named Cornelius. Can you say Cornelius? Cornelius. Yeah, it's kind of a big name. And another man, that's a little bit easier to say, Peter. Can you say Peter? Peter. Peter. There you go. Well, Cornelius lived a long, long time ago. And um, he was not Jewish, but he and his family worshipped the God that the Jewish people worshipped. And they were kind people. Cornelius would give money to poor people to help them out. And um, they loved God. And one day, an angel came down to Cornelius and said, you know, God has seen what you're doing, and he wants to give a special blessing to you. He said, I want you to send some men to a town called Joppa and find a man named Peter and invite Peter to come and eat dinner at your house. That sounds like a good idea. Would you like to get invited to somebody's house for dinner? Sure. So anyway, meanwhile, Peter in Joppa was just sort of hanging out one afternoon, and he was really, really, really hungry. And he got sort of faint, and he suddenly saw a vision. And uh, Peyton and 
Olivia, yeah, you want to go down there, and then you can show it to them and show it to the others. A sheet came down from heaven. <laughs> sure, you want to, then you can kind of, yeah. It came down from heaven. Maybe you want to show it to the congregation, too. There you go. And there were all sorts of creatures on this sheet. You can show it to the kids again here. Now, there were probably no stuffed animals, but, you know, that's the best I could do at my house. And there were snakes on there. There were just, yeah, pigs, things that people normally didn't eat. But um, a voice said to Peter, go ahead and eat some animals because you're hungry. And Peter said, I can't do these. These are unpure and unclean. But the voice said, I created these animals, and therefore they are clean and they're pure. And this went on three times. Peter just could not believe that God wanted him to eat those animals that were in that sheet. But after the third time, Peter kind of understood what was going on, and the sheet went back up into the heavens, along with all the animals. Thank you. <laughs> so... He didn't go right out and eat any animals, but uh, right after that happened, these soldiers that were the men from Cornelius, they came to Peter's house. And they said, we are going to invite you to lunch. So Peter went with them, and when he got there, Cornelius and everybody greeted them. But Cornelius said, you know that because we're not Jewish, you're really not supposed to come into our house to eat dinner with us, because that's a law. And Peter said, Yes, but that's an old law, because God has told me that if he created you, you are clean and pure, and I get to have dinner with you guys at your house, because God is made for everybody, not just Jewish people. So Peter went into Cornelius' house, and they had a good time. They ate dinner, and they listened to Peter preach about Jesus, and Cornelius and his family were so happy that they all decided to accept Jesus that day in their hearts, and they were all baptized. And so the lesson that was learned from this was that God created all of us, and he doesn't like one group better than another group. If you love Jesus and have him in your heart, you are pure and clean, because God created all of us. And that's kind of the lesson learned. So that's a story about Peter and Cornelius. And you can go back to your seats. And I hope you have something for lunch besides stuffed animals. <laughs> thank you, Ziggy. And thank you for bringing kids. 498 is our next hymn. We're going to be singing verses 1 through 4. He comes to us as one unknown.
apologize. I went out of order. <laughs> While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and, he, and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in a shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for all who work in the church. Lord, let us hear from you during this message. now that I went out of order. <laughs> so what is an enemy? There are many definitions for an enemy. One who opposes, hates, causes injury to someone or a group of people are the most clear definitions I could find. And we've taken this notion and created barriers as we humans do so well with many groups of people, I think. I've always said as a student of the Bible and have learned, as I've learned about Jesus that we shouldn't really have human enemies, that our enemies are spiritual and not of this world. They're forces that hold us back, as Paul writes in Ephesians, that we will study more in depth later in Acts, when he says to put on the armor of God. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That, to me, is the only enemies we should worry about in order to live in true Christian form, which relates to this quote by Carl Schmitt. He's actually a Nazi and a theorist. It says, tell me who your enemy is, and I will tell you who you are. If your enemy is spiritual evil, then you are a child of God. I know there's many verses in the Old Testament about enemies. 
Almost always this has to do with God bringing the Israelites through to survive. And there are other verses that discuss enemies of God and that they'll be judged by his sovereignty. But never does it say we are to be the judges of who the enemies are. And this is my belief, and yet we do so all too often. We're encultured into a society that prejudges all the time. We put people and groups into boxes. And I believe that dis, dis, displeases God. And we should constantly be on the lookout for how we do this, and unwittingly at times. This reminds me of an upcoming course from the Church of the Brethren Discipleship Ministries later this month, titled Discipling Our Imagination, Interrupting Our Biases, and I hope to take this and share some of what I learned afterward with you. It's just like three weeks, two hours, I think. And I know we all have this implicit bias, ones we don't think about. They're automatic. Now let's look at a word that relates to this message today, prejudice. The definition says it's a preconceived opinion, not based on experience or reason. Now you may see there is reasons for prejudice, but many times it's based on what's been relayed to us via someone else or in society. We're such social beings that prejudice remarks have such a huge impact on us in ways we take in so deep that they cause us to have these implicit biases, meaning ones we don't realize we even have. In a sermon on this text by Joseph Smith, he mentioned how prejudice is like a disease. And he says it exists because we find it more comfortable to live in unexamined feelings rather than out of compassion for people. And this brings to mind this, the quote from Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. Anyhow, these unexamined feelings have misunderstood bases. And it means we're thinking in principles or categories rather than really getting to know individuals. Prejudice means putting labels on things and living out of feelings rather than examining the human need involved. We use labels to try to understand one another, and we think this better, we better understand someone because of their age, their race, their political affiliation, their religion. With every label, we have a cluster of images. And we could think of someone's education, socioeconomic level, even their sexuality, and we think we know who someone is. But do we? I am more than whatever labels put a, people put on me. I'm unique. Prejudice per Joseph Smith is a kind of laziness that pigeonholes people, and then we don't have to really get to know who they are, to know them personally. But don't we know that Jesus came to break down barriers? At the cross, he broke down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile and any other division we can put up, black or white, denominational, rich or poor. Even in the Old Testament, we saw there was no partiality with God. He saved Nineveh through Jonah, Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabite, who was an ancestor of Jesus. Elisha saved a leper. I could go on and on. Yet the Jews didn't get this message, it seems. Now let's look at who Cornelius was. He was a Roman soldier, a centurion, who was in charge of a hundred men. And even a regular one would consider themselves better than the Jews. And by the way, there was another centurion lifted up in the New Testament at the crucifixion. He was there and exclaimed, if you remember, that this man surely must have been the Son of God in Luke 23. Now Cornelius had to see through labels and biases that surrounded him, but God saw his heart. The text says he was a just man who feared God and was charitable and a praying man and a good neighbor. And we know who Peter was an apostle, a preacher, and yet he had to be humbled to see past his own prejudice 
and be able to really grasp the grace of Jesus. He was still living under the law, and this vision was to show him something new done through Jesus. First Cornelius is told it by, by an angel in a vision to send men to get Peter. And now picture this next scene, Peter's praying. He's hungry and asks for some food to be made. And as he's praying, he falls asleep and has a dream. A sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of animals on it, some of it which would be against the law to consume. They abided by what we now call kosher food rules. And so when he heard a voice saying, kill and eat, he said, no way. I won't go against God's law. And three times the Lord says to him, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Well, all three times Peter refused. Then he woke up. And what did he miss while he was napping? There were messengers downstairs to take him to the house of Cornelius. He was about to come into contact with a real human in need. And instead of thinking and acting by principles, he would have to choose to react to the person, the need of a real human. And this is why I think it's so important that we get to hear stories of real life people, not just about groups of people, to hear from individuals. This was so powerful to me during the ecumenical advocacy days regarding creation care that I told you about a few months ago. They had so many real life stories from real people about how they, their families, their communities were affected by climate change. How the quest for power and greed was harming their lives in real unquestionable ways. It was a real in your face experience. And they, like, look at what has been done to our farm our fishing, our livelihood, our towns, our families. Look at us, hear our voice. These stories were so powerful and I wish more people would have heard them, that this got more intention than just the people who were paying to hear them. It was like a preaching to the choir, really. But I will pray that more of these stories get to be heard I think this is an important part of my ministry and always has been, to try and lift up the voice of the people that remain unheard, those with little power. I remember being involved in community ministry meetings with many leaders, no, there weren't ministry, I'm sorry, community meetings with many leaders during my seminary internship as a community minister. And I was able to really speak up for a few homeless people I'd gotten to know and families receiving housing support. We have to really listen to real life stories. And like my previous pastor, Phil Adams, who you'll get to hear from next week, used to say, you have to know that that could be you in order to really have empathy. Well, I don't know. I probably will never know what it is like to be an Inuit in the wilderness, the forest, or a tiny village decimated due to a pipeline or mountaintop removal or even a person of color in the ghetto. But I can listen. I can try to use my privilege to speak up for them. I can try to choose a person over a principle. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what his parables taught us? Michael Moore said maybe Peter remembered the parable of the publican that Jesus taught in Luke 18. In it, a Pharisee says, thank God I'm not like those people. Swindlers, evildoers, adulterers, I give tithe. I fast, I pray. But the tax collector, who put his eyes towards heaven and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner, was the one that Jesus said was justified. He said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Or as it says here in the message, if you walk around with your nose in the air, you will fall flat on your face. Both men were doing what Jesus said, though. And, not, and so not only do we see the eunuch saved, now we see what is thought of as the enemy to Christians, 
a Roman soldier, their persecutors, those who abetted to having Jesus killed, saved, grafted into the family of Christ. No more barriers, no more walls, no more divisions. And too bad this message is still lost on us today. Who is our enemy? Is it Muslims? Is it any political figure? Are they even fellow Christians? What do you think Jesus would say? And let's look at what Jesus did say briefly about enemies. Here's one of his statements in Luke 6. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other one. For one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. And another from Matthew 5. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In Romans 12, Paul writes, If your enemy is hungry, feed them. Thirsty, give them something to drink. And did you notice the scripture I put in your bulletin today, right under the date from Proverbs 16, 7, says, When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. See, it wasn't all about wrath against enemies in the Old Testament. It says here that if the Lord likes the way you're living and doing things, then your enemies, and I will add those who you think are your enemies, as I said, I don't think anyone has them, but perception matters, that they will make peace with you. Or at least, I guess, we can let it go, right? I don't think everyone will make peace with us, but we don't have to let it bother us forever. We can forgive, move on. Not hold grudges. You know, that's just my thoughts on that. But let's get back to the scene. Peter discovers that he has something to give someone else who needs it, mainly for them to know about Jesus, even though he's not part of the saved group, not chosen, so to speak. But is he? Now he realizes that God shows no partiality. He gladly goes and shares what he has with the someone from another group, a race, ethnicity, culture, even when considered an enemy. God is calling them both to share and receive from each other. Cornelius is not too proud to acknowledge he has a need. He asks for help. And we as a multicultural nation can sure learn from this lesson. Our individual cultures might be incomplete. We can learn from each other. Per Joseph Smith, and I agree, and breaking down the walls of prejudice can happen, he says, when someone on any side of the divide realizes they have something to learn and can learn from someone who's different. One of the reasons I love this scene is how Cornelius falls down to Peter's feet and says, and he says, stand up, I'm just a man. I know the one who can help you, though. I can point you to the one who saves, who can help with anything you need. Peter knows he should not be idolized, and that if Cornelius looks up to him alone, it wouldn't be good for either of them. So Peter says, just talk to me, eye to eye, human to human. Let's learn from each other, and let's look to Jesus for for forgiveness and wholeness. And that's what Peter is sharing, the grace, the forgiveness that Jesus offers everyone. That's the good news for all, and what we need to proclaim as Christians. Everyone receives forgiveness of sins through the name of Jesus. We can't say we're better than anyone. We're all in need of forgiveness, and Peter got it. Do we? Another great sermon on this text I read was from Kenneth Sauer from 2015, and he gave an illustration of a young C.S. Lewis who told his father, I'm prejudiced against the French. And when asked why, he said, well, if I knew, it wouldn't be prejudice. 
He says that it's because prejudice is about prejudging, that we don't even know the facts, and if we do look for facts and find some, it's usually just enough to back up our own case, ignoring the rest of the story, or not in touch with personal stories of real people, instead ideas about groups of people. And there was lots of this between Jews and Gentiles, and we know this continues for millennia, even till today. Per Sauer, this chapter of Acts is the biggest growth of Christianity. It dramatically points to not just being a religion for Jews, that the radical love of God is extended to anyone. It is a religion for all nations and people. So what prejudices is God breaking down in your life? Who have you come to know and respect as an equal instead of unclean or impure as a result of your faith? I know many stories of people who had this revelation about homosexuals or transgender individuals. And Sauer's sermon is titled, Is God Bigger Than You Think? I really like that. He says, some people in the world look at Christians and say, your God is too small. But Sauer says, and I agree, that it is not that God is too small, but our perceptions can sometimes make him or her out to be that small. Even how we assign a gender to God, like he's an old bearded man up in the sky. But I know God is much bigger than that, way more broad than our narrow thinking of binary genders and ways and is way bigger than our prejudices also. Sauer asks a question I will pose to you as well. Is your perception of God getting bigger the more you study the scriptures and live out your faith? Are you more accepting of others due to Jesus, more empathetic and loving? I hope so. Peter and Cornelius would not have mingled together, not have tried to get one in it to know one another, so are you mingling with those that are not like you? Are you open to learning from someone who you think is beneath you? And are you challenging that belief due to the knowledge of Christ's love for all? Peter was raised with strict boundaries of who was in and who was out. But God was showing him that Jesus was about the new, the unexpected revelation about how God creates every person wonderfully. How mature Christian understanding comes to know this from within and from scripture. The deeper Peter plunged into knowing the heart of Jesus, the more unwilling he was to confine himself to dogma, to artificial boundaries set by Judaism or anything else. See, this is a lesson in inclusion for us today, I believe. It's a story of how the Holy Spirit accomplishes things despite the boundaries we build. In this text, it says, while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on everyone who heard the word. It was poured out to the Gentiles. Will we learn, will we let it pour over us? Will all who hear have ears, as Jesus would say? Can we relate this to how those with differing gender identities than the way we have been taught to think of them, sexualities that differ from the norm, are created by God to be who they know they are to become due to their relationship with Christ, to our relationship with Christ? Can we envision a church that accepts all and lets Christ handle their individual sins? which may be different than what we think of at first or for us. And it might be none of our business. Now, one may say, would you let someone keep robbing and not tell them to cut it out? This is very different to me. And of course, there are many things I could say besides this as being a sin that needs to be dealt with. First of all, if you confront someone with this, I just know the Holy Spirit would have already been saying something to them, groaning to them that they needed to change their behavior. But who one loves or what gender someone is, are these things that harm others? Isn't love love? 
Isn't someone's journey about their apparent need to be a different gender already a hard enough road to travel without being identified as not loved by God? If Peter had not swallowed his pride, realized how his own prejudice was blinding him to the grace of Christ for all, God would have found another way. And I believe this is the case with the church being open and affirming with also, that God will find a way. Like we learn from Gamil in Acts 5, if it is of God, it will find a way. And here in this story, Peter allows himself to be used to show that God is way bigger than what we had thought or what the Jews had thought. And I think God is still teaching that lesson to us today. Not only does the story show us to not make judgments about people, it shows us the importance of preaching the gospel, per Hope Bollinger, not a perversion of it. Think of how many people nowadays are seeing Christians in ways we would not want to be known, as perpetrators of hate even, sorry. Works instead of grace, rules instead of love. I could go on and on. God sent me something needed to fit right here on Facebook Friday, an article titled, What if Jesus really meant all those things, he said. In it, the author thought, brought an example, you may have heard, of how Gandhi, when asked if he were a Christian, said, I sure like Jesus, but Christians seem so unlike their Christ. So what do you think about the way Christianity is portrayed in the world today? If you don't speak up, then others will think that when they hear about Jesus, it's from what they hear about in the news. So we must tell of what Jesus said and live it out. We must be on the lookout for misrepresentations of the way, of what being a Christian really means to us and speaking up about it, even if it's not agreed upon by all Christians. I say as followers of Jesus, we must put aside our differences and find common ground with other Christians so others will know us by our love, as scriptures say, so that we can share the good news about Jesus and see lives changed by Christ. Both Cornelius and Peter were in the same unrighteous position before God. That is what I think we must find is common ground with brothers and sisters in Christ that we may disagree with. We're both in need. We're all in need. And that's what's important. That it's about Jesus, not us. It's about the gospel, not about our opinions. That it's about grace and love and peace, not righteous indignation and finger pointing. I leave you with this quote from Pope Francis. We are all sinners, but may the Lord not let us be hypocrites, for they don't, do not know the meaning of forgiveness, joy, and the love of God. May we be like the tax collectors and not the Pharisees. May we point to Christ and not our own knowledge and the word of God instead of our own biases and prejudices. Amen. Now we will sing, You Shall Go Out with Joy. Oh, we'll do it twice, okay? Shall go out with joy. 
Go out with joy and peace, knowing Jesus brings redemption for all who trust in him.